anxiety, fear, all of this broad host of emotions and feelings would never exist if sin had not entered the world. And as those who know Jesus Christ as Savior, we who are people of faith recognize that you have taken ashes and chosen to give us beauty for ashes. It is as we go through these painful experiences and confusing scenes that you are conforming us to the image of Christ, preparing us for holiness in all of its glory as we step into your presence. We ask today as we open your word that you would honor yourself, that as the text and the truth come to pass, that we would exalt over Jesus Christ and his cross work for our salvation. That the Spirit of God would have freedom to take the truth and seal it to our hearts. And that we would honor your word. Father, thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you know the name of William Graham Scrogey, but William Graham Scrogey was the director, the head of the Bible school that was started by my son, my name is called, his name is called Blake. The great British Baptist expositor. Roll. Spurgeon. I know I remember. Spurgeon. As the head of his college, Scrogey wrote the following concerning Genesis. He said, the book of Genesis begins everything except God. It is the foundation of all of God's revelation. It is the fountainhead out of which flows the precious water of life in God's river of truth. It is the mighty root from which is spread the tree of leaves, for the tree with leaves for the healing of the nations. And it is the seed basket out of which the harvest of salvation comes. We begin in Genesis 3 with the seed of a woman. And then we come to Genesis chapter 15, the seed of Abraham. And then when we get to the end of the book, it is the seed of Isaac, of Jacob, and ultimately the seed of Judah. He is the lion of the tribe of, the, of Benjamin. Now, I'm at the lion of the tribe of Judah. In your notes, if you'll notice, I have placed a simple outline because something that we're going to enter into today is going to actually expand uh, in the life of Joseph. So I need to lay this groundwork. When you outline the book of Genesis, there are two broad themes. Those two broad themes are degeneracy and regeneration. Both of them are critical in the book. In chapters 1 through 11, you see from the fall of Adam a pattern take place. There is the curse. The curse affects, first of all, Adam and Eve. In Genesis 4, you have the story of Cain and Abel. In Genesis 5, you have the descendants of Cain. And ultimately, in Genesis chapter 6, when the flood comes, the world was only evil continually. Out of the curse comes the catastrophe, which is the worldwide flood, God's holy retribution on sinful man. In spite of judgment, and this is where we have to be careful to understand how God reaches people. God judged the world, but between Genesis 6 and Genesis chapter 10, where you have civilization and the Tower of Babel, the world unites against God. Judgment does not always cause mankind's heart to change. The goodness of God leads men to repentance. So that brings us to the rest of the book. One fourth of the book almost here. Three fourths of the book where we're about to turn. You go from primeval history to now you come <clears throat> to patriarchal history. This is the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. 
we speak of Joseph, but it's really the biography of Jacob. Look back at Genesis 37, verse 1. Genesis 37, verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history. This is the genealogy. This is the record, depending on the translation, of Jacob. So everything in the life of Joseph is flowing out of Jacob. And the theme in the last three verses of the book is regeneration, dealing with the theme of grace. First of all, you have Abraham who is the loving father who offers his only son. God will provide himself a sacrifice. Genesis 22. You have Isaac, the only loved or dearly loved son, is the way it's stated in Hebrew, who takes a bride in Genesis 24. You have Jacob, who continuously is battling his own nature. He is called the Dr. and Jekyll, Mr. Hyde of Scripture. On one scene, he seems to be good. The next scene, he's a very evil man. He illustrates for all of us the conflict we have with our own evil carnality. We never conquer Adam in us. God can, but we will never be free from Adam. Sinless perfection is not possible. And finally, Joseph. Joseph reminds us of a very important truth. That is, coming out of dealing with our carnality, moving toward holiness as our ultimate objective. Suffering is a prerequisite to elevation to a throne. In other words, if we are saved, we are all called to suffer. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer, the Bible tells us. So suffering, adversity, and affliction they are the normal lot in life. If trouble comes, God is not punishing us. It is part of the course. That's like saying I would like to get a degree in education, science, or the Bible. You never have a test. It's not possible. It doesn't happen. Education requires a time of us facing crisis or catastrophe or calamity. Now, when you look at the life of those four men that are in the book of Genesis, you find that every one of them illustrates in some way how God works to regenerate and ultimately bring about his ultimate purpose. In the case of Abraham, you have a divine call. Remember, God called Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees. And he's a reminder that Romans 8, 29, whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. Moreover, those he foreknew, he called, then he justified. And the call begins the work of God in our lives. Every one of us who is a Christian at a time in our life when God spoke to us and showed us our personal need of Jesus Christ. Secondly, <clears throat> Isaac, was born, Romans 4, when Sarah's womb was no longer uh, capable of bearing seed. And Abraham was no longer capable of fathering. In other words, it is a miracle. John 3 tells us, Marvel not, I say to you, you must be born from above. In birth, the seed, the word of God. And the Bible tells us the life God the Holy Spirit come together and the new birth experience takes place. You who are dead in trespasses and in sins, he has quickened. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Those of us who have been saved have been saved to divine transformation. That's the ultimate end. Romans chapter 8, listen again. Romans 8, 17 says that if we suffer for him, we will be made like him. Sanctification, which is the process of God transforming us to the image of his son, preparing us for pure holiness, if I may state it that way, is the lifetime experience of the believer, which involves where the life of Joseph comes in, divine elevation.
Ephesians 2, verse 5, the Bible tells us that he has seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Let me just say something, and this may surprise you. One fourth of the book of Genesis deals with Abraham, but there are more verses in the book of Genesis about Joseph than there are about Abraham. You say, why is that? Because divine birth takes place in an instant. The process of God conforming us to the image of Christ and preparing us for heaven is a lifetime experience. It is not an accident that that takes place that way. Um, let me read to you. This is from the book by Gary Richmond entitled The Integrity of a Man. <clears throat> Gary writes, there is something curious about the birth of a giraffe. I stood at the zoo at just the right moment to witness the amazing interaction between a mother of a newborn. Standing right next to me was the zookeeper, Jack Benall. <clears throat> As the mother gave birth to a calf, the hooves and the head were already visible as I stood there. Pardon me. When is she going to lie down? Jack responded, she won't. But that's a 10-foot prop. Isn't anyone going to catch that cat? Jack responded, try to catch it if you want. She has enough strength in her hind legs to kick you a half a mile. Obviously, metaphorically. Soon the calf hurled forth, landing on its back almost motionless. Less than a minute passed. Something totally shocking. Mother kicked the baby. She booted it so hard that it sent it sprawling head over heels. Why'd she do that? She wants it to get up, responded Jack. Somehow, the newborn recognized what she was wanting and struggled to rise. But after a few feeble tries, he gave up and dropped back to the ground. Boom! A second hearty kick from the mother rolled the calf again several times over. And again, it tried to get itself up, finally managing to stand. Then, almost unexpectedly, as he gained stability, mother kicked him off his feet again. This time, the keeper did not ask for a question. He said, she wants him to remember how he got up, because in the wild, he will follow the herd, or he'll quickly be, be kicked off by predators. And he said, why would you use that story? Let me ask you some practical questions. Have you ever been kicked before you were ready to stand? Have you been kicked by someone that you thought loved you? Have you been kicked more than once by someone who loved you? That story reminds us of a basic principle of life. Pain does not begin after we leave the home. Some of the most painful experiences in life begin in the home. In the case of Jacob and the case of Joseph, you see a home that is characterized by envy, jealousy, hatred, spite, revenge, cruelty, and ultimately seeking the very life of Jacob. So with that in mind, take your Bible and turn with me, if you will, to Genesis 37. Thank you very much. Beginning at verse 18. <clears throat> Our text for today begins at Genesis 37 and verse 18. Now when they saw Joseph, him, afar off, even before he came near them, that's the brothers who were gathered together at Dothan, Verse 18, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, Look, or behold, 
This dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Note those words, because they will echo throughout the rest of Joseph's life. Let's see what happens to the dream if we destroy the dreamer. But Reuben, Reuben is the firstborn, the oldest. <clears throat> but Reuben heard it, and he delivered Joseph out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him. That he might deliver him, that Reuben might deliver Joseph out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers, and they stripped Joseph of his coat of many colors, tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. They took him and cast him into a pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ismaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, palm, and myrrh, on their way to carry them down to Egypt. <clears throat> so Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and could see his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ismaelites, and let not our hands be upon him. He is our brother and our flesh, and his brothers listen. Then many not traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Israelites for twenty shekels of silver, and they took him to Egypt. Let me show you on a map what takes place. Joseph has a discussion with his father. <clears throat> that discussion with his father takes place here, where he is living in Hebron. Hebron is 40 miles south of Jerusalem, another 15 miles to Shechem, and 20 miles to Dothan. Mm -hmm. Joseph's brothers have actually trekked all of this distance looking for grazing land. Now, you may not appreciate this, but if you've been to the Mideast, this is barren desert land, so there is not a lot of grazing land. For them to have traveled 75 miles is not unusual, and it may not have taken a day, but it may have been over a period of time. Joseph is concerned, and I think you need to know there are a couple of concerns. Go back, if you will, to Genesis chapter 30. <clears throat> I am suddenly having trouble with my allergies, and I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 30, notice verse 43, very last verse, gives you a perspective on, Joseph, on Jacob. Thus the man, Jacob, became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. So he's a very wealthy man. It would be a real good uh, victory for some thieves to take the animals that belong to him. So Jacob sends Joseph to find the brothers. There's another important factor. Turn, if you will, to Genesis 34. Genesis chapter 34. And notice, if you will, please, Genesis 34, to give you the chapter background. <clears throat> Dinah, Joseph's sister, was raped and married the prince of Shechem. Joseph's brothers uh, deceived the Shechemites and told them that if they would be circumcised, there would be no trouble. After they were circumcised, when they are physically weakened, 
the brothers come in with swords, they kill people in the city and take over. It's a victory for them. The important point is down in verse 30. Genesis 34, verse 30. Jacob is speaking to the leaders of this uh, slaughter. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me by making me obnoxious. Would you note those words? Joseph was obsessed with self protection. <clears throat> You have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. So, why has Joseph been sent? We've got to find the brothers. We've got to find the flock. This is where they are found, at Dothan. Do any of you remember another time the name of Dothan comes up in the Bible? Read the story of Elisha. Elisha is, uh, Dothan is important in the study of Elisha, and I'll just leave that with you. Now, the Bible tells us very interestingly, they saw Joseph's coat of many colors on him. That in the dream set them off. Let me read to you some interesting information that I think will help you to understand what this is all about. Most of us can remember the coat of many colors because in our minds, the coat of many colors symbolizes as a child beauty, but it doesn't symbolize beauty in this story. There are only two possibilities. Possibility number one, the coat of many colors, and it's translated, by the way, depending on your translation, it may read long sleeve, like the Christian standard, or may, like the New International. Very, variegated, or very, various colored, the legacy and the Septuagint. Richly embroidered, the International Standard. The Masoretic text simply reads long sleeves. The contemporary English reads a fancy coat. What we know about that coat is that coat, which was of many colors, may have been either many parts, like a quilt, least likely, or it may have been, just as is pictured on your flyer, a coat that had various colors. You said, why is that important? Because in the Bible days, there were not many dyes. You read only occasionally of cloth that is dyed. For example, Reynard the Harlot and her scarlet thread. Uh, we read of Lydia and a dyer of purple and very wealthy. So, where did all this colorful garment come from? It's important for us to realize, and this will become important in the story of Joseph, from the Far East, Asia, the Northwest, a uh, Northeast, Northwest, pardon me, Europe, Southwest Africa, the main trade route is always along the way of the sea, right through where Joseph and Jacob lived. And remember, what did the men see when they were here? A Midianite and an Israelite caravan. They were selling goods in Egypt. It's from Dothan down to Egypt where Joseph was taken, 300 miles. So Joseph is carried into captivity at the end of this chapter. What did that coat symbolize? Take your Bible and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 21. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 21. There are two possibilities that are reasonable. Deuteronomy 21. Notice, if you will, please, Deuteronomy 21. And let's begin reading at verse 15. Deuteronomy 21, verse 15. This is God giving the second rendering of the law. 
regarding marriage, regarding family. Deuteronomy 21, verse 15. If a man has two wives, the Bible doesn't say that God commanded. But if it happens, here's what should take place at his death. Listen carefully. If a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, does that not remind us of the story of Rachel and Leah? Now listen carefully to what it says. And they have borne him children, both the loved and the unloved. And if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, and the firstborn son in Jacob's family was born to Leah, and his name was Reuben. Now keep that in mind, listen carefully. <clears throat> then it shall be on the day he bequeaths his possessions to his sons, that he must not bestow firstborn status on the son of the loved wife in preference to the son of the unloved, the true firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength and the right of firstborn is his. Now, Reuben deserved as the firstborn of the inheritance. But remember, in Genesis chapter 38, Reuben went to bed with Bilhah. And as a result, 1 Chronicles 5 1, his own stepmother, as a result, God took the firstborn right from him. Well, if the firstborn is Reuben, who is the next firstborn son? It's not Bilhah's son. It's not Sophar's sons. It falls naturally to his second wife, Rachel. And her firstborn son is Joseph. So the coat of many colors could be the birthright. And to some extent, that's true. Take your Bible, turn to the New Testament, to John chapter 4. And let me show you something in John chapter 4. <clears throat> John chapter 4, if you'll turn there in your Bibles. In John chapter 4, Jesus has to go through Samaria. Samaria would basically be this area of the land of Israel. Jesus, normally, if the Jew were going to Jerusalem, they either would take the route through beyond Jordan or the route around Samaria. They did not enter this land. And it was, in a sense, an act of repudiating what had taken place when Israel allowed herself to be united with Assyria and going to paganism. Well, when Jesus goes through Samaria, the Bible tells us he came to a well and met a woman at the well. Listen to this very simple. It's a passing statement. There is nothing in the Bible that is not important. The only reason I direct this to you is it's part of the story, but it teaches us an important idea. There are people who don't care about the details. That's not good Bible. Listen to this passage statement. Verse 5. So Jesus came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Technically, do you know that Jacob didn't give any of his land to Joseph directly? He didn't. No, he did not. Surely you can prove that from the Bible. That's a very arrogant statement. Thank you. Now turn to Genesis chapter 48. Say, well, eventually, in all my life, 
Genesis 48. Genesis 48, and notice, if you will, verse 3. Genesis 48, verse 3. <clears throat> then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at last in the land of Canaan and blessed me, and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. He continues. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Sorry, did everyone get back to the one of them? No. No. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. If you look at the history of Israel and how God dealt with the nation, Manasseh and Ephraim possessed as much land as the other tribes. Just those two sons of God, you're about to see the transfer of property. It goes over Joseph to his sons. And all throughout the Old Testament, Ephraim becomes the symbol for the whole land. Ephraim has turned himself to idols when it all. So Ephraim and Manasseh are about to receive the inheritance, the birthright inheritance. Look, if you will, at Genesis 48, and let's continue at verse 5. An important lesson here. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, they were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt. They are mine. And Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring whom you beget after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers and their inheritance. But as for me, when I came to Patnar, Rachel died beside me. And I was about to bless the sons. And do any of you remember what he did that was in the mission? That one. When it came time to bless, Jacob did not say oldest and youngest. <coughs> he switched his arms, youngest and oldest. <coughs> and Joseph takes a chance and puts him in the right place and he says no. Because all throughout the book of Genesis, the youngest son is chosen. Not Cain, but Seth. Not Ismael, but Isaac. Not Esau, but Jacob. Not Reuben, but Joseph. Because the theme of the New Testament is actually laid in the book of Genesis. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Israel was God's firstborn. The church is the secondborn. It's all throughout Scripture. Grace is about giving the least deserving and passing over the most deserving as we perceive. And so in this story, God has laid the groundwork for the whole gospel message of the New Testament. So, the birthright. But there's one problem. The birthright also gave you something else. It made you the king of the family. It made you the priest of the family. But it also promised you that the Savior, the Messiah, would come through your family. But remember, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Wait a minute. Not Joseph, but Judah. Mm -hmm. It is a reward that God gave to Judah for being willing to sacrifice himself for Benjamin, for Joseph, for the family, illustrative of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Joseph appears to have at least 
some of the perfect life. But there is another possibility. I remind you in the book of Luke, chapter number 15, the Bible tells us of a father who had a son who went to the far country, and the prodigal son came home, and the first concern of the father was to put upon him a what? Robe first and ring. Robing was an act of loyalty. All throughout the Old Testament, you will hear of the robe of a prince, the robe of a princess, the robe of a king. And remember when Joseph put that robe on and told the dream of the stars of the sky and the various astronomical things worshiping him? And the Bible tells us, and I ask you to remember, Joseph kept these things in mind. The Bible tells us that Jacob rewarded as a future act almost prophetically, Joseph, you're going to actually rule as a king. And he does. He rules Egypt. Now with that in mind, let's go back to a very important scene and some very practical questions. If we have to answer this question, if God is all-powerful and loving, why does he place us, others, anyone in the pits with such pain? Shouldn't God shield us from pain and suffering? It almost seems like we who are people of faith live with more problems than those who do not have faith. And we almost feel like, God, this is an injustice. I've said before, we had a lady in the church when I passed her here, a very godly woman, her son came down with cancer and died, and she asked the question, why is God mad with me? And I said to her, God is not mad at you. God allowed his own son to suffer. Suffering precedes glory. 1 Peter 5, verse 1, Peter said, We, looking at Christ, are a witness of the sufferings and the glory that shall follow. The call to suffer is not an American message, but it is a biblical message. And if I've been saved, God has not promised me easy street. God has promised me an uphill battle where I continuously must come back to, he is first, and I am willing to lose, and it is only by death that he brought forth life, and it's only by my death that life will come. So I am constantly watching, as the Bible tells me, the outward man is perishing, that the inward man might be renewed. So when I come to the story of Joseph, let's go back to Genesis 37. And notice, if you would please, in Genesis 37, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 37, notice, if you would please, Genesis 37, and I'm going to begin reading in Genesis 37, verses 24 and 25. Genesis 37, verse 24. The Bible says in verse 24, Then the brothers took Joseph and cast him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. And then notice these words. And they sat down to eat a meal. Now that may not be significant to you, but I think it's very significant how they responded to Joseph's suffering. I'm not sure if I were to watch someone else in suffering, I am beholding it yet and hearing their cries and recognizing their agony right now. If I would say, let's sit down and enjoy a meal together. My stomach might be turned, and some people who would seem to see if they had already eaten would lose every bit of their food. The reason this little phrase is recorded as it is, is to let us know what they really thought of what had just taken place. 
Joseph's brothers looked at Joseph in the pit, and they said, this is the voice of God. This is what God intended. After all, didn't he send the Ishmaelites? Didn't he send the Midianites? It's amazing how much hatred, how much cruelty is in our hearts as people. Do you remember these words from Proverbs? Rejoice not when your enemy suffers. How many times have we enjoyed, have we savored, have we really flourished when someone else is hurting? They deserved it. They got their just desserts, we tell ourselves. And in a very real sense, Joseph's brothers look at their circumstances and because all is going well, they believe the hand of God is actually honoring them. One of the greatest tragedies in humanity is how much malice is in our hearts. Take the Bible and turn with me, if you will, to Titus chapter 3 for just a moment, but an important statement. Titus, 1st Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. Titus chapter 3. Paul is admonishing young Titus to tell the believers in Crete how they are to respond to a godless government. And in Titus chapter 3, he goes into an observation of why we should be gracious even when ungodly rulers are cruel. We've just gone through a scene in the last few years of this. When COVID came along, we said to ourselves, no, some of us said to ourselves, this is all political. This is all evil people and we don't have to listen. And yet, this statement is in the scripture. Titus 3, verse 1. Paul says, remind those who are in the church, remind them, remind believers to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Pause. Do you know what the words ready for every good work means? It means when the street needs succession to clean it, we volunteer. It actually is a second mile idea. He goes on to say this. Verse 2. Don't criticize them. Don't badmouth them. To speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle. And here's what's to characterize our relationship. Showing all humility to all men. Why? Because he goes back to our unsaved condition and reminds us when we see it in them, don't take it personally. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. The very first sin ever committed in the Bible was committed after the fall by Cain, slave, Abel. It's very normal for us, in spite, in revenge, in getting even, to seek power or desire among another person. That's exactly how they perceive what just took place. Because of the hatred that they had, they can't even look at the truth through eyes of purity. Sitting down to eat tells me they have no remorse. Their conscience has been seared. They have callous consciences and they rationalize their sin. Turn back to Genesis 37 and let us notice a second perspective. The second perspective is that of Jacob. Genesis chapter 37, 
Bible tells us after Joseph had been thrown in the pit, they took the coat, and let's uh, drop down if we could, please. Verse 31. So they took Joseph's symbol of royalty, killed the kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, pardon me, then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We found this. Do you know whether it is what? <laughs> Just a little slip of the tongue, isn't it? Irony. And he recognized it and said, It is my son. And a wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Joseph tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. And Joseph saw this as a time to fall apart. I may have mentioned this, but my dad was killed in a tragic uh, industrial accident. My grandmother, who we lived with at the time, when they came to tell her of my dad's death, I can to this day, almost like I'm still in that room, hear her pounding on the kitchen table. Oh God, no. Oh God, no. Oh God, no. And sometimes in tragedy, we fall apart. Do you realize how often in Joseph's life he didn't take problems and pain very well? He's not like Joseph. Joseph and Jacob are entirely different personalities. Turn to Genesis 42 for just a moment. Another scene, and he makes this statement. Genesis 42, notice verse 36. <clears throat> Genesis 42 and verse 36. The Bible tells us, And Jacob their father said to them, you have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. This is because they are in Egypt. And you want to take Benjamin? Note these words. All these things are against me. God is out to get me. God is not protecting me. Joseph makes a mistake that we all often make. The worst thing that we can do as believers is let circumstantial evidence feed our ego and cause us to jump to conclusions. It's not only true in sports, it's true in scripture. It ain't over till it's over. You see, the problem is that Jacob isn't looking at the end. He's looking at the present. All that matters is what's going on right now. This is the last chapter, so to speak. And it's never the last chapter to we're in the throne of God. There's something God is doing. And sometimes in our lives, our lives are like the coat of many colors, and there are multitudes of events and multitudes of emotions that are being woven and cross-weaving in order to accomplish what God wants in our lives. It isn't normal to love those who hate us. It isn't normal to serve those who abuse us. It isn't normal to be a blessing to those who curse us. But the truth of the matter is, when God is at work in us, Rather than responding to circumstances, we respond to the call of God. Someone has said that Christians get their best exercise in jumping to conclusions. And we do. Far too often, we at the beginning of the story already have concluded the story when we don't know what God is unfolding. Thomas Kurt made this very interesting statement. In Jacob's mind, if the dreamer is gone, the dream is gone. What Jacob does not realize is that the dreamer does not touch the dream. 
The dream sets its own course. The dream is going to take Joseph, his brothers, and his fathers down entirely different paths until it ultimately unites them together in wholeness, healing, and holiness. And so we must allow God to do what he wants in our lives in the confusion. Every one of us have played the various parts of the triangle that this story unfolds for us. So let me mention the third person. To Joseph, this was a ferocious or fierce circumstance. Why did this happen to him? If I could put it this way, he was the holiest of them all. He was the kindest of them all. He was the most caring of them all. And look what happened to him. Now, for the record, turn to Genesis chapter 41 for a moment. Genesis 41. Notice in Genesis 41, Joseph takes a Gentile bride. It's one of seven famous Gentile brides in the Old Testament. She gives birth to two sons. Notice verse 51. And Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh. And what does Manasseh mean? Listen. For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Secondly, verse 52. Notice in verse 52. And the name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. If I can tell you some words, I'm getting over inside what is going on on the outside. <coughs> I'm actually experiencing healing. Here are the various responses I wrote down. You have, first of all, with the brothers, content for both the dream and the dreamers. You have a battle between those who are dreamers and those who are dream killers. For Joseph, the dream is a catastrophe. For Joseph's brothers, it is a conquest. For Joseph, the father, it's a whole calamity. But we need to remember that providence is always at work and moves all of the evil in our lives downstream. Even when the evil appears to be against us, God is using it for us. There are scenes in our lives that we look as God failed us when what God really did is God was breaking us <coughs> to break us. <coughs> it is impossible to live in this fallen world and not be hurt by the sin of others. It's just impossible. It's foolish to think that other people can't dump in our lives, can't build hurdles for our lives, can't cause suffering and pain to come to us. That's not realistic. <coughs> the that Adam and Eve said, their son kills his brother. It's the inevitable result because the problem is man is a sinner. In the midst of the suffering, what you learn is that God's compassion will always overrule you. As I said a moment ago, we've all played the parts of this triangle. But the dream does not depend on us. Yes, I'll back. Psalm 115, and verse number three. But our God is in the heavens, he does whatever he pleases. Turn to Isaiah 46, if you would. Isaiah 46, and we'll finish in just a very few moments. Isaiah chapter 46. 
I notice if you would please. Verse 9. Isaiah 46 and verse number 9. Isaiah 46 and verse number 9 says this. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling the bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it, I also have purposed it. Uh, pardon me, I also will bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I will also do it. George Bush, the old English commentator, said this concerning Joseph. It is the story of the overruling power of God. It's wonderful in its counsel and mighty in its operation, so that even the free and voluntary action of his brothers, even prompted by evil, renders God renders those actions subservient to accomplish his good purpose even though they are intent on defeating him. And finally, William Taylor said this, in seeking to defeat God's purpose, they were all the while unconsciously helping in its fulfillment. His brothers were bent on making the realization of his dream impossible, yet by their very actions, they moved him one step closer to elevation. Their bad use of the dream confirms that God makes the worst of vices to accomplish his best of purposes. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for the fact that even when we see painful, tragic, agonizing suffering, it does not mean you have failed. You can only cause good to come. As creation was made, you saw that it was good until man sinned. And in our fallen state, you worked, and the only time you work is to bring about good. Because we know that all things work together for good to those who are called. Called according to your purpose. In order that Jesus Christ might, as our Savior, be the firstborn among many brethren, allowing us by your grace to stand holy and without blame before you in love. In his precious name we pray.